Albert. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, welcome to our fireside. I'd like to begin with a bit of a narrative. A couple of weeks ago, I invited a few of my friends to a talk uh, by Dr. Augusto Lopez Claros, who spoke at length about issues involving uh, racism and the financial aspect of it, you know, trying to eradicate poverty as it relates to race. And one of my friends who I invited, uh, a very good friend of mine who I used to work with actually, uh, is a, he goes by the name of Hassan. He's uh, originally from Jordan. He's a Sunni Muslim. And he commented on the talk. He said, it's so fascinating that you can have someone speak so authoritatively and genuinely about religious works and they're not a priest. And that's a matter of fact. Uh, for those of you who are uninitiated uh, or, or unfamiliar by any means, uh, the Baha'i faith is a religion without an ecclesiastical caste. We don't have monks, we don't have priests, because we're all expected to be priests. What results of this is that whenever we try and get people together to disseminate wisdom much in the same way as a priest would give a sermon, we have to get creative because we don't have anyone on retainer who's getting paid to do exactly that. I am very, very, very lucky to introduce our speaker tonight because he's a huge inspiration of mine, right? If anybody among us was going to get paid for the work that they do, it should be Corey. <laughs> This guy, I mean, he wouldn't be a priest, he'd be a cardinal. He has a masterful understanding of the Baha'i writings. And I attribute that uh, in no small part to his mastery of the English language as an attorney full time. You know, this is his side job, is giving these talks. So I am ready to be impressed. I hope you all are similarly ready to hear the wisdom that this gentleman has to offer. He's a huge inspiration to us all. And without further ado, Corey, you have the floor. Well, um, I hope I can live up to that um, introduction. Um, uh, everyone can hear me, yes? Yes, um, indeed. Okay. Uh, we've got a lot to go through, um, so uh, I'm going to dive right in. Um, I'm not going to dive particularly deeply into any of these topics because um, there's only so much time and uh you know solving racism um is a is a pretty serious hefty undertaking um i also want to leave some time for questions um, but if anyone wants to look into these further i'd be happy to point you in the right direction so uh i'm going to be talking about uh what the baha'i faith has to say about um curing this disease treating and curing this disease of racism um, so first, I'm going to answer some questions like, why should we care what the Baha'i Faith has to say? Uh, what exactly is this disease racism? What are some of those treatments? And how do we implement them and who should be involved? Those are the five questions I'm going to answer. I'm not going to talk about what harms racism does um, or what it feels like to experience racism. I think we will leave that to someone maybe more qualified to talk about that. Um, through personal experience. Um, so diving right in, uh, why should we care what religion has to say about curing racism? Um, well, uh, in the Baha'i faith, we view uh, the purpose of religion as creating unity and um, treating the diseases of each era. So this is a quote from Baha'u'llah. Um, oh yes, let me, let me share my screen here. Uh, okay. The prophets of God should be regarded as physicians whose task is to foster the well being of the world and its people, that through the spirit of oneness they may heal the sickness of a divided humanity. These are not days of prosperity and triumph. The whole of mankind is in the grip of manifold ills. Strive, therefore, to save its life 
through the wholesome medicine which the almighty hand of the unerring physician hath prepared. So what does this mean? Well, the physician, capitalized there, that's God. God is the unerring physician. The prophets of God uh, speak on behalf of God and give us the, uh, the prescription, right? That's what a doctor does. A doctor gives a prescription and a diagnosis. A doctor does not uh, treat usually. Treatment is usually done by nurses or even more so the patient themselves, right? So that's something that we need to keep in mind and come back to. But the purpose, and notice that it says the prophets of God. So this is all of them. All of them um, have this purpose of uh, treating the sicknesses of a divided humanity. Now, there's a part in here that uh, I didn't read where he says that, of course, the treatment is going to be different because the diseases are different uh, from one era to another. Um, so uh, what's the disease of our modern time? Well, the disease of today is disunity. Um, that's, what's, that's what's ruining the world. That's what we need to overcome. That's what we need to treat. And one of the most extreme forms of disunity, obviously, is racism. So how would we define racism? Well, um, this is from, I think, Merriam-Webster, a belief or doctrine that inherent differences among the various human racial groups determine cultural or individual achievement, usually involving the idea that one's own race is superior and has the right to dominate others or that a particular racial group is inferior to the others. Now, what's, what you see, there's a lot of different definitions, but what you see in all of them in common is this notion of superiority and inferiority. Right? That's the essence of racism. It's the belief that one group is superior and there, therefore another group must be inferior. Those go hand in hand. You can't have superior without an inferior. Um, and what's interesting about this is that the need to feel special and superior to others is sort of an intrinsic need of all of humanity. It's an instinct. Uh, the need for status actually may exceed the instinct for survival and reproduction. You can see a lot of cases where people uh, are willing to die for their status, right? Or they're so ashamed that they commit suicide. That's, that's an instance where their instincts about status have overridden their basic instinct of survival. So these are very, very powerful instincts, these status instincts, this striving to, to dominate and be superior to others. And that's because we're a social animal. I mean, that's just part of being that type of creature. In our, in our material form, we are a social animal. Um, and so we have those instincts to, to strive, to feel superior, to dominate, and so on. And Abdu'l-Bahá says that the love of self is part of the clay of humanity, right? So it's just built into us. Um, now, racism uh, is a very extreme and dangerous example of this need to feel superior. Um, it's sort of like a, a superiority derived from a group membership, right? It's not actually saying, I'm superior because I'm strong or I'm superior because I'm smart. It's saying, I'm superior because I'm part of a group that has accomplished great things. Um, and the group is smart or the group is strong. And it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a cop out actually, because you're kind of taking, if you're, if you're racist and you believe that, that uh, white people or some, some nation or whatever are superior because of all the things they've done, you're sort of taking credit for a lot of things that other people did and you had nothing to do with, right? If I say, oh, I'm so great because because look at all the Germans, things Germans did. I didn't do any of that stuff. I didn't paint any of those paintings or compose any of that music. So, so it's, it's kind of like taking credit for things other people have done. And of course, we know, as we've talked about several times over the last couple of weeks, it's a lie, right? There's no races. Um, it, this doesn't exist. And, and, you know, besides all the genetic evidence that you can have for this, you can see historical evidence, too, because racism isn't even consistent, right? So who's white, right? We, today we have these notions of who's white, but um, not too long ago, the Irish were not considered white, right? And now the Irish are definitely considered white. 
So if race were a real thing with any kind of biological or, or tangible basis, that wouldn't happen. Um, but we know it's, it's not real because it's ephemeral and it's, it's slippery. And, and you know, why, why, is, why is Barack Obama black? He's half white and he has a, a white mother and a black father, right? Why was Tiger Woods black? His mother was, uh, I think, Korean or something like that, right? So you can see how it's not real. It's just this slippery ephemeral thing. And it really mostly exists in the mind of racists, not in, in the minds of, of uh, their victims. Um, so, you know, it's still, in spite of it being not really real and sort of slippery and ill-defined, it still explains a lot of what's going on. Um, and, and I'd like to, you know, we spoke about W.E. Du Bois um, last, last week and the week before. Uh, I want to bring him into the conversation again because he had one of the most profound theories to explain um, what's going on there with this racism. So he was trying to explain why did poor whites fight to defend uh, slavery during the Civil War? And why did poor whites um, resist labor unions and things like that in common with black people? Like they would rather have no union and get terrible wages than form a union with black people. Um, and, and, you know, and plantation economics kept poor white farmers even more poor. So why would they fight for that? And so his answer to that is this concept called the wage of whiteness, the psychological wage. So there's no monetary benefit, but there's a psychological benefit. You're paid in the form of getting to feel superior, right? So if you're a poor white guy in a Jim Crow type society, you may have no money and you may be struggling, but if the, all of society and all of the way it's organized and the way the police enforce the laws and, and just everything all up and down the scale tells you that you are superior to everyone whose skin is different from yours, then you get to feel superior in spite of any number of indicators in your life that might actually tend to make you not feel superior. They might tend to make you feel like you're actually being oppressed. Um, so it's, it's all about this totem pole, right? And, and actually, you can see the same thing in other prejudices like sexism, right? So if, if, you're, if you're a man who's accomplished nothing in your life, but you're extremely sexist, you get to feel superior to 50% of the population automatically without having done anything, right? So that's sort of what's going on here. It's this idea that society has been set up in a certain way to make these white people feel superior in spite of their, you know, uh, in spite of the fact that they're being oppressed by the same economic forces that are oppressing black people. Um, and that need, again, you know, like I said earlier, that status is so important to people that they'll fight to the death for it, even if it's not really good for them. Um, and, and by the way, this, this helps to explain why equality is not good enough for someone in this mindset, right? If you tell someone who's in that mindset, oh, don't worry, we're not trying to make black people or women have more rights than men or than white people. We just want everyone to be equal. What could be wrong with everyone being equal? Well, that's not going to be satisfying to someone who's built up their sense of self-worth and status predicated on other people being beneath them. Because even equality means they're moving back down the totem pole because there isn't this group of people underneath them. So that's, the, you know, equality is not going to be good enough for someone in that mindset. So this is the disease that we're talking about. It's this Malady of thoughts, it's kind of like a cancerous malformation of your pride, kind of pride gone wrong and mutated into this weird form. Um, so that's the disease that, that, that needs to be treated. So how can religion uh, treat this um, and change this? Moving on to this section. Well, first and foremost, religion is an update to value systems. So when a new religion comes, it updates values. So I've heard this analogy before. It's like a software update, a patch or whatever, right? Um, but it, it, the idea is that values get altered. Um, and so here, uh, let me share the screen again. Um, 
Uh, here is a quote. This is one of the hidden words um, demonstrating the new value that's being taught here. O oh, children of men, know ye not why we created you all from the same dust, that no one should exalt himself over the other. Ponder at all times in your hearts how you were created. Since we have created you all from one same substance, it is incumbent on you to be even as one soul, to walk with the same feet, eat with the same mouth, and dwell in the same land, that from your inmost being by your deeds and actions, the signs of oneness and the essence of detachment may be made manifest. Such is my counsel to you, O concourse of light. Heed ye this counsel that ye may obtain the fruit of holiness from the tree of wondrous glory. Now, we, we read this, I believe, last week, um, but it's important, so we're coming back to it. Um, God is telling us here that this is the reason we were all created from the same substance. There's two treatments of racism in here. One is this common origin, right? You're all created from the same substance. So you're all the same, right? You're all, we are all nuclear waste uh, left over from the explosion of, of stars. That's how all the heavier elements than hydrogen in our body were created. And so we are all just stardust or nuclear waste, um, if, depending on how you want to look at it. So we're made from the same substance. But the second treatment of racism kind of lesson in here, value in here, is, um, is the humility, right? No one should exalt himself over the other. Humility is very important here. Um, and, you know, if you look in the Baha'i writings or frankly, any religious text from any era, you will see references to humility again and again and again and again. It's, this is a point that gets really driven home because it's very important. Humility is one of the most important lessons that religion can teach humanity. And it has to be repeated again and again because we keep not getting it. Probably because we have that intrinsic selfishness that we're always fighting against. But basically what it boils down to is this, you know, humans have this unique, um, tragic awareness of their place in the universe, unlike other animals. And we have this instinct that tells us we need to feel special and unique and important, but we're capable of perceiving the universe to a degree that we see all of this overwhelming evidence that we are not special at all, that we're just a tiny speck in a universe that's enormous. I mean, there's, there's more stars in the galaxy by two or three orders of magnitude than there are people on the earth. Right. Every one of us could have a hundred stars just to ourselves in this galaxy, assuming there's some, not anyone there. And there's billions of galaxies. So we're like really tiny and insignificant. And we know it. And it's kind of like a tyranny that we suffer under because we keep fighting and trying to make ourselves feel special. How do I make myself feel special? Maybe I can buy something. Maybe I can have myself be superior to this other person. Maybe I can get some rank or promotion or something. There's dictators in the world that have devoted their entire lives and, and ruined the lives of millions of people in their country just to get that tiny feeling of specialness, right? And it's, it's just a tyranny because you can never ever feel special enough to overcome your awareness, even if it's just unconscious, that someday you're gonna die and your, your body's gonna be buried in the ground and you're gonna be forgotten and the universe is gonna go on for billions of years and no one will remember that you ever lived because that's the facts, that's reality. You are not special. And so one of the most important things that religion can teach is this humility because religion teaches that we are important and loved and valued by God, even if we're not special. We're not special but we don't need to be special to be important because God loves us anyway, right? And so this can be the wellspring of all of our humility, right? We acknowledge that we're small. We acknowledge that we're weak. We acknowledge that we're not special, but it doesn't make us sad. It's okay because God loves us and we love each other, right? And we acknowledge that we're not special, but we're still important to each other, even though we're imperfect and we're all going to die. So that's really important. This humility is really important. And it is the most important value update 
that could undermine and, and sort of uh, erase um, this, this racism and other forms of prejudice. Because if you're humble, then you don't need to feel like you're superior to other people. You don't even want to feel superior to other people. If you're truly humble, if you're truly aware of your place in the universe, you'd realize how absurd it would be to even think of yourself as superior to another person. One tiny insignificant glob of nuclear waste calling itself superior to a, another glob of nuclear waste. I mean, it's absurd. They're both tiny specks in the universe. It's ridiculous. And so that lesson can completely undermine um, the notion that superiority is possible, but it also removes the need to feel superior. Because if, you, if you're humble, then, then you acknowledge your place and it's okay. And God loves you and it's okay. And other people love you and it's okay. And you don't need to be part of that endless rat race of needing to feel special. You don't need to put yourself above anybody else. Um, so that's the most important value. Um, there are other treatments I could go into. I will just briefly touch on them. Um, the community itself can be a treatment to racism by example, right? We, we show interracial amity, um, a lot of, uh, you know, of, of the earliest um, interracial couples, you know, in, in various places where Baha'is, uh, um, we, we put diversity in practice. Um, in, in, and if it's going well, uh, if we're doing it right, it's, it's very natural, right? It's not this forced kind of awkward diversity. It's a very natural diversity that's sort of unremarkable, right? You, you walk into a Baha'i space and you see people of different races just being completely normal with each other. Um, and it's natural because everyone there is just a person and no one's even really thinking about it. I remember one time uh, I went to, I was going to a Baha'i event in a community I hadn't ever been to. Um, and I, I walked into the room where I thought it was and I knew immediately I was in the wrong room because everyone in the room was white and they were looking at me suspiciously, All right? And then I, I realized that there were two events in that same building. And so I found the correct room and it was diverse and everyone was smiling even though they didn't know me and so i knew i was in the right place um even even without you know any other confirmation than just this visual um another lesson that uh the baha'i faith teaches um, that can treat this racism is that uh, racial harmony is not about tolerance it's not about putting up with people of other races it's about loving them it's not about accepting diversity begrudgingly. It's about valuing diversity. Um, so here I will, I will read another quote. Um, Baha'u'llah has proclaimed the oneness of the world of humanity. He has caused various nations and divergent creeds to unite. He has declared that difference of race and color is like the variegated beauty of flowers in a garden. If you enter a garden, you will see yellow, white, blue, red flowers in profusion and beauty, each radiant within itself, and although different from the others, lending its own charm to them. Racial difference in the human kingdom is similar. If all the flowers in a garden were of the same color, the effect would be monotonous and wearying to the eye. Therefore, Baha'u'llah hath said, that the various races of humankind lend a composite harmony and beauty of color to the whole. Let all associate, therefore, in this great human garden, even as flowers grow and blend together side by side without discord or disagreement between them. So in this beautiful um, and, and visually evocative statement, Abdu'l-Baha is telling us that um, this diversity is, is good. It's not just something we should put up with. It's not just some curse that's befallen us. This is a, a beautiful thing that we shouldn't just tolerate, but value. We should actively value this. Um, uh, another thing we can do, right, is, is sort of like there's the battle of the thoughts, the battle of the minds. Um, I don't have this one on a slide, but I'll just read it to you. Um, this is about war, but we can apply it to, to prejudice as well. 
I charge you all that each one of you concentrate all the thoughts of your hearts on love and unity. When a thought of war comes, oppose it by a stronger thought of peace. A thought of hatred must be destroyed by a more powerful thought of love. Thoughts of war bring destruction to all harmony, well-being, restfulness, and content. So Abdu'l-Bahá is talking about this sort of like the war of the thoughts, right? And we have to we have to beat back bad thoughts with good thoughts. And that's true both in our own minds and in sort of like society at large. We have to find those bad thoughts floating around and replace them with good thoughts. So these are some of the ways that we can, um, you know, treat racism by updating people's value systems. Um, sounds easy enough, right? Just update everybody's value systems, right? Um, that's it. Good night. No, obviously there's more to it than that, right? How do we do that? So before I go into that, I want all of you to think about the times in your life that you've actually managed to change somebody's mind about something. And if you're being honest with yourself, you will acknowledge that that's not very often, right? Like you've actually changed someone's opinion on something, not taught them some fact they didn't know, actually changed their opinion, their mind. And think about how you actually accomplished that. What, were, what was the method you used to accomplish that? Has anyone in the history of the world ever changed someone's mind by yelling at them? Let's just uh, think about that while I read this quote. Um, this is Baha'u'llah talking about the power of words, um, a power that we don't um, acknowledge nearly enough. Every word is endowed with a spirit. Therefore, the speaker or expounder should carefully deliver his words at the appropriate time and place. For the impression which each word maketh is clearly evident and perceptible. The great being saith, one word may be likened unto fire, another unto light, and the influence which both exert is manifest in the world. Therefore, an enlightened man of wisdom should primarily speak with words as mild as milk, that the children of men may be nurtured and edified thereby, and may attain the ultimate goal of human existence, which is the station of true understanding and nobility. And likewise, he saith, one word is like unto a springtime, causing the tender saplings of the rose garden of knowledge to become verdant and flourishing, while another word is even as a deadly poison. It behooveth a prudent man of wisdom to speak with utmost leniency and forbearance, so that the sweetness of his words may induce everyone to attain that which befitteth, befitteth man's station. Uh, I'm going to let's see if, if, uh, if, this will, if this will work. Okay, can you guys see that? It's bolded now? Yes. Okay. Mild as milk, utmost leniency and forbearance. This is a way of speaking to people. This isn't just about the words you choose, although it is about the words you choose, because one word is like fire and one word is like light. One word is like springtime and one word is like poison. But it's also the appropriate time and place. It's also the way you speak, mild as milk, leniency and forbearance, right? He is saying here that you are not gonna get through to people if you don't use your words with wisdom and care. If you use your words negligently, uh, you will not get through to people. Your goal here is trying to give people understanding and nobility and so you have a big responsibility, and that's to use your words properly. If you use your words improperly, you could make it worse, right? Because if you give someone words like poison, you are going to make it worse. Um, in another place, he says, the tongue is a smoldering fire, an excess of speech, a deadly poison. Material fire consumeth the body, whereas the fire of the tongue devoureth both heart and soul. The force of the former lasteth but a time, 
whilst the effects of the latter endureth a century. Right? So your words may linger for a long time afterwards. You may say something harsh to someone and they're going to remember it for the rest of their life. Okay, so use your words with care, absolute patience, gentleness, right? And remember, someone who's a, a sort of afflicted with this mental illness of racism, they're probably already feeling insecurity about their status and place in the world. Uh, that may be one of the main reasons that they're clinging to racism in the first place is because of that status. So if you make them feel like you're attacking them, what do you think is going to happen, right? Racist, calling someone a racist, that's a powerful and stigmatizing insult. There's, there's few things in our society these days that are worse, sort of considered worse than being a racist, uh, which is a sign of progress, I have to say, but it's true. Uh, so if you call someone racist, you're going to hurt their feelings. You're insulting them, even if it's true, right? Just because something's true doesn't mean you should say it. Uh, right. You could you could tell me that I've wasted half my life on frivolous nonsense and that most of my suffering is the result of my own bad decisions. And that would be true. But you shouldn't say that because that's mean. Right. And you never say things like that to your spouse or your loved ones. So why would you say something like that to a stranger and expect it to have a better effect than it would on your spouse? Um, also, uh, you know, don't virtue signal if someone thinks that the reason you're, you're speaking to them is because you want to make yourself superior by being the not racist, the woke, um, enlightened fellow who's calling out all the racists. If you're drawing attention to yourself on purpose, then that's also undermining the whole point. If they, if people are very sensitive to this kind of like phoniness. And if someone senses that your whole purpose in calling them racist and calling attention to their racism is to elevate your own status, then they're going to become defensive because they're, all that is is you're trying to lower their status to elevate your status. And that's not what we're trying to do here. What we're trying to do here is cure racism, not um, steal other people's status and, and give it to ourselves by calling people out. Think about family relations, right? If, if, you're, if your loved one or spouse is doing something that you think is absolutely wrong, what kind of tone would you use to try and persuade them, right? You're not gonna, if you wanna actually succeed, right? Like has I told you so ever actually worked in all, of, in all the history of all the marriages that have ever been? No, you, you have to speak gently, carefully, cautiously, right? We could go back to those words as mild as milk and, and utmost, what was it, uh, um, utmost leniency and forbearance, right? That's how you speak to your spouse or closest loved one if you're trying to see, get them to see that something isn't right. So, and, and, and that's your only chance of it working. And, and if, you know, if you yell at them and berate them and make them feel stupid, you're not gonna get them to see what's going on. And if, if yelling and berating and making someone feel stupid won't even work on your spouse, why would it work on a stranger, right? There's no way that a stranger is gonna give you the time of day if that's how you're, um, if that's how you're speaking about them. And, and for what it's worth, you know, if you, if you look into some of these anecdotal accounts where people talk about like converted racists, right? Racists who, who have changed their minds and, and stopped being racist, even some extremely, uh, extremely virulent racists. The way those stories usually go is that it starts with someone in the group that they were being racist to patiently listening to them and talking them to them like a human being and acknowledging their insecurities and, and whatever's going on in their life. And that feeling of being listened to opens the door to a connection and seeing this other person as a human being. Uh, I don't think I've ever heard of a story of, of someone um, who was racist, who stopped being racist because they got yelled at a lot, right? I don't, I've never heard a story like that. Maybe you guys have, but I, I haven't. Um, so um, moving along, who should be involved? Uh, oh, well, let's just summarize, right? So. We're trying to update people's values. 
who are trying to spread these ideas of humility and that diversity is a good thing, all of these things. We want to update people's values. And the only way to do that is to speak to people with words as mild as milk and with uh, uh, the um, utmost leniency and forbearance and choosing our words with, with great care because if we choose them wrong, we might make things worse. We might give them the poison or the fire. Um, now, who should be involved in this process? Uh, well, the answer is everyone, right? The doctor writes the prescription, the doctor doesn't implement the cure. Um, in the Baha'i faith, there's no clergy, there's no one in charge. Um, we all have to be the nurse and we all have to be the patient and we have to implement that cure. And as was alluded to in that reading um, earlier on by Nassim, uh, that includes the victims of racism. The victims of racism also have to be involved in this. And that kind of doesn't seem fair at first, if you think about it. Like, you know, why should the victims have to be the ones to help their own oppressors overcome uh, their own mental illness? And I, I think I can answer that by way of analogy. Uh, if you imagine that like some alcoholic is driving drunk and wrecks your car, and then comes up to you and says, hey, by the way, sorry, I wrecked your car. And also, I need some money for rehab. That would seem pretty outrageous, right? Like, you would never want to give them any money because why should you? They're the one that wrecked your car. But if you turn that around and imagine that the alcoholic in that story is a treasured family member, right? It's your father, your mother, your sister, your brother, your son, right? Your son wrecked your car because he was drunk and now he needs money for rehab to turn his life around. Does that change the answer to the previous question? Should you pay, should you help them? I hope it does for all of you. Um, and, and that's how we're supposed to view each other. We're supposed to think of each other as family members, right? One human family. That's not just flowery talk when, when uh, all the religions in all of history have said that, that we should treat each other as family, as brothers. That's real, like that's literal. We should treat each other with the same respect and forbearance and love that we would treat our own closest family members. Um, and it's just, it's the nature of the world that people in trouble lean on others that are stronger uh, and more able to help, even if that's not always fair. A racist might not deserve words as mild as milk or utmost forbearance, um, but really what's more important, like paying them back for all the bad things they've done in kind or trying to transform them into someone who's not racist anymore, right? So I, I think even though it, it hurts and it seems unfair, what, what's being alluded to in that, in that uh, passage we read at the beginning is that everyone has to be involved in this process. Even, even the victims of this racism have to show that forbearance and those words as mild as milk if they want this to actually go away. Like if you just want to feel better, then yeah, by all means, you can, you can yell back at the racists. But if you want to actually try and make things a little bit better, then everyone has to do this, even the victims. Um, and that's kind of the burden, you know, like we've been given this cure, we've been given this prescription, so now we know what needs to be done and now the burden is on us to actually do it. And it is kind of a burden because we don't have an excuse. Like someone who doesn't know any better, doesn't know how to fix racism, they're not responsible because they don't know, but we know, so we're responsible. Uh, now, I, I wanna say one thing about that analogy. I wanna go back to that rehab analogy for a moment, um, just so that there's no confusion. Um, so if someone you know is ruining their life with alcohol uh, and they're gonna lose their job or their marriage or they're gonna fail out of school or something like that, that would be an appropriate time maybe to speak to them with words as mild as milk and with utmost patience and forbearance, right? However, if someone is completely drunk and about to get in their car and drive somewhere with their children in the back seat, words as mild as milk aren't gonna cut it and you need a stronger response, right? So we're not saying here that if you see an angry racist about to kill somebody that you should throw mild words at them. Um, or that someone who's about to be killed should ask nicely that that not happen, right? In that kind of situation, a different sort of intervention is, is required. Um, 
preferably one that involves the authorities, um, which hopefully aren't the ones doing the killing. Um, unfortunately, that's no guarantee. Um, the, the, the purpose of these, these, uh, these mild words and this forbearance is, is not to stop imminent violence. It's to transform society gradually, right? Winning hearts and minds slowly change society, not prevent imminent racial uh, violence. Um, you know, and, and just, just the way that some people might be so ill that there, there's no way to treat them and some addicts, you just can't save them. There might be some people whose racism is so far gone that it's not possible to get them to turn around. Uh, we still have to try. Um, but you know, the, the irredeemably, incurably violent racists didn't build our unjust society on their own. There just aren't enough of them to have built the, the injustice that we have today. They had a lot of help from lots of people with less severe cases of racism and therefore more treatable cases of racism. In particular, this extremely widespread form of racism of apathy, right? All these people who, who know that it's wrong, but they just kind of don't care enough to put a stop to it. That's racism because it's, if you don't care enough to put a stop to it, then you're devaluing the people who are suffering, even if you know it's wrong. I mean, I, I would say probably that's the biggest change in what's going on these last couple of weeks is that people are actually starting to care, right? Like everyone's known about police violence and, and racism for, for as long as, you know, as long as we've been a country, but now people are starting to care enough to actually do something. Um, so that's our goal. That's what we hope to do, uh, to treat this, this mental illness in individuals and society by kind of gradually changing their values to, to get them to see the importance of humility, to get them to see the value of diversity, whether it's through our words or through modeling how beautiful diversity can be in our own actions. Uh, those are the ways we can treat it. And so, um, I hope all of us uh, can, can summon up enough um, energy to do that um, and enough patience and wisdom to do it in, in mild words uh, to not make things worse. Thank you. Mm. Mm. Okay, Dr. B, you can have the first acknowledgement. A word is not sufficient, really. I have to tell you that uh, I love this man very much. <laughs> for lots of reasons, you know, he's like one of my sons, really. And uh, he has a eloquent tongue and also that mild word that he was talking is really, he is master of it and he's really good at it and he knows what he says. I really thank you very much, uh, Corey. You really, <laughs> I, the, my word is not sufficient really to thank you enough. Uh, that's okay. That's from the bottom of my heart. Uh, I really mean that. Uh, but I thank you anyway, and I pray that you'll be more successful in your endeavor, really. Dara, I'll leave it back to you. Yeah, I, I echo the sentiments as well. And Corey, just thank you. Thank you for the wisdom that you brought mm -hmm. in such a tangible way with always grounded in the writings and then also with analogies and helping at least me be able to access the wisdom. So I'm super, super grateful. All right, friends, now is time for questions. And Corey, you can also see in the chat box the acknowledgements coming in from people. Gary, an excellent presentation, thank you. Tina, yes, thank you. So in addition to the love and acknowledgement for Corey and his excellent presentations, what presentation, what stirred up for you? What questions do you have? Um, and, and maybe even how to, as mild as milk, take this work out into the world and put some actions to it from a, a social justice lens. And while you're thinking about that, I know I should be quiet and keep calling self-discipline and give you some think time, but also really appreciated, Corey, how you um, elevated equal is not equitable. Right, and so we're not all, especially for enslaved folks, people of African descent. They didn't. They didn't. They're not here 
they didn't have the same starting line. There's so much to um, catch up to in terms of access. And so everybody just starting at the same point would not be fair and just. So I really appreciated that. And I know Ziba, you're always my right hand woman looking to see who I've overlooked with questions. Uh, what, one thing you said, which, which made me think, um, you know, one thing that's, that we can do is practice, right? Um, eloquence, uh, mild mannered words, uh, learning about the right time and place to say things, uh, all of that stuff, it doesn't come naturally. Nobody, well, let's say very few people are born with a natural talent. Um, these things come through practice. Uh, and so, you know, it's important to go out there and try, even if you don't succeed, um, just try and, and learn, you know, and, and talk to people. Um, you know, I, I mentioned um, the, the work, I, I mentioned that, that the victims uh, need to be involved too, but um, I, I, I hope it goes without saying that, that uh, you know, the, the people, uh, the perpetrators, uh, let's just say white people, also need to be involved, right? There are certain people out there um, who will not listen to a member of a minority group telling them about racism. They're, they're so far into the racism that they're not going to listen to those words and take them seriously. Or they may assume, well, of course, this person is saying they, they want better treatment. They just want to like improve their lot in life. That this is just a cynical ploy to, to, get, to get something. So it's very important that people from the privileged and advantaged groups also be out there talking about this because there are some people out there who will only hear the words if it's coming from someone in their same group. And, there, and when you're speaking as a member of the privileged group, talking about how the privilege is unfair, then it's harder to be accused of wanting to get something out of it, right? So it's important that everyone participate in this process of, of spreading these values. Um, and yeah, practice, 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 practice. Talk to people. And Corey, something that it really excites me, really encourages me very much, is the number of young people that I see genuinely they want really to deal with this issue mm -hmm. and there are people in this group that they are working very hard in that issue if, if they wanted to say something I know young people you know that they work in this area um, so Dara raised a very important point um, you also have to listen right um, that may be even more important than anything else you do. The, the people that you're trying to break through to are not going to respond if they feel like they're not being listened to. They need to feel like they're respected. They need to feel that human connection. And so it's very, very, very important to listen. And uh, in, in, our, in our culture, especially in, in the West and in America in particular, we have a tendency to use the period where other people are talking to think about our own response instead of actually listening. And, and we could learn some lessons from some of the other more laconic cultures, like the Native American cultures, where you very deeply, carefully, ponderously listen to every word someone is saying, and then think very carefully about your response before you, you say it, not just you know half paying attention to them while coming up with something clever to say. Um, really deeply listening is extremely important. So thank you for bringing that up, Dara. Well, uh, thank you. Oh, sorry, you're the one who brought it up, Corey, actually. I was just reiterating it in the chat box. And so Bob and Phyllis have a question. Aren't we all disadvantaged by racism? Ultimately, we are, yes. Um, in, in, especially in a deeper spiritual sense. Um, we are definitely all disadvantaged by racism. I'm sure uh, next week, I believe, Dr. Lopez is going to be here talking about some of the economic consequences of racism. And I'm sure he'll be telling us that they affect everybody. Um, but we also have to be careful when we say something like that, not to make it sound like 
we're implying that um, because everyone's disadvantaged by racism, which is true, um, we don't want someone to think that maybe that means everyone's equally impacted by it, because that's definitely not true, right? Uh, there are certain groups for whom um, it's dangerous to even, you know, be in certain places. They could die. Um, so I, I could give a personal example of this. Uh, I grew up in Israel. Um, I was the only non-Jewish kid in my entire neighborhood and in my school. Um, I was the only blonde kid. I was a head taller than everyone else. So I experienced a bit of something that might be called racism. However, at no point um, did the police follow me around or treat me with distrust. At no point did people assume that I was lying, you know, authority figures assume that I was making up stories or anything like that. So while I experienced a certain amount of like, outsiderness and a certain amount of prejudice, I still had, you know, white privilege, if you want to use that, that term. I was, I was given the benefit of the doubt. Now, if I had been maybe an Arab, the only Arab in a Jewish neighborhood, maybe I would have felt something like the suspicion and the constant, you know, harassment and, and doubt that authority figures uh, in this country have a tendency to shower on people of color. Um, so there, like, this is just a way of saying there are different degrees of this and not everyone is impacted equally. Um, and we have to kind of think about that um, delicately and sensitively. Um, Thank you, absolutely. So question about Abdul Baha's point on racism. Hi, Corey. I, I was talking to Nasser about this. Mm -hmm week when uh, Abdul Baha was in America, the turn of the 20th century, he gave a talk <clears throat> at Howard University to a black audience. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I didn't understand it that well, but when, when you were talking about, you have to bring the victims into the conversation, you know, he, he was talking to them and said that they should be grateful in some, in some respects, even though they were it poorly treated for hundreds of years. Um, the tens of thousands of white people gave their lives for their freedom. And they had opportunities in America that they wouldn't have had um, uh, in Africa and, and maybe some other points. But that was a hundred years ago. I don't, I don't know what we could ask the victim, victims to be uh, grateful for now or how to get them into the conversation. Uh, well, I, I think something that we should remember um, is that everyone should be grateful at all times for the, the blessings that they have. There's no one on earth who is bereft of all blessings, has no blessings at all. So we should all be grateful for, for the blessings that we do have, whatever they may be um, and wherever they may come from, um, because humility is important for everyone. We all have to have that, that humility. Um, and, you know, without, I mean, basically, it's also possible for someone who's a victim of any wrong, whether it's racism or, or, you know, abuse in a family or any wrong you could name, it is possible for someone who's been victimized to adopt a self-righteousness um, that, that becomes a sort of self-elevation. Uh, it's a sense of superiority based on, on suffering. I've suffered so much, you haven't suffered, you don't know what I've gone through, et cetera, et cetera. And that's just a repeat of the same like dangerous concept of specialness and superiority. It can come from anywhere. I, I mean, everyone in the world is an elitist about something. There's people in the world who are elitists about how they're not elitists, which is really quite ironic, but it's true. Um, so this is something we all have to watch out for. Um, we, we can't elevate our suffering into yet another um, form of, of way to feel superior. And that's true of everyone, whether they're a member of a, of a victimized group or just a regular human being who's, who's been beaten down by circumstance. Um, everyone should be humble and everyone should be grateful. 
and focus on those things instead of uh, you know focusing on the negative things. Thank you. These such thoughtful responses. Um, while we're waiting for some other questions, so Corey, I'm curious because you talked about you know our words as mild as milk. And as a restorative practitioner, for me, the word victim, I mm, bristle. Right. What do you feel about the people who have been harmed and those who are responsible for the harming? Yeah, there is a lot of, um, it's true. There, there's the, the word victim is actually um, not cool anymore. Um, there's a lot of fields where they try and avoid that word um, in, in, um, in, in, certain criminal cases, they use the word survivor instead of victim, mm. um, for example. Um, so that can, be a, uh, that can be another example of a word that to be careful with. Um, there is sometimes an implication that a victim is helpless or something like that. Um, but you know, the, the, the thing about words and, and you know, choosing the right words is that it's actually, uh, very particular to the people you're talking to. Um, and, you know, some people, for example, some people like the term African American, some people don't like the term African American, right? Some people like Native Americans, some people don't like Native Americans, some people, some Native Americans prefer to be called Indians, right? So this is very, very particular to the type of person that you're talking to. And the only way to figure out that you know the 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 correct way to speak to someone is to be very humble and kind of gentle and have a whole like body affect that feels harmless so that if you say something that they don't like they're not going to jump to the conclusion that you're trying to hurt them because your whole body language and your whole countenance is of, of harmlessness and and sincerity they'll realize that you've made a mistake and they'll gently correct you instead of like being offended. Um, so that's, that's another part of it is like your whole countenance has to be gentle and mild as milk and so on so that people um, give you the benefit of the doubt. Absolutely, and you certainly do it that way. So very grateful. Any other questions? Jennifer, do you have a question? Wait, uh, um, you're muted. Go um, ahead. Oh, there you go. I just wanted to ask, like, when you talk about vocabulary, I find one of the important things about vocabulary is um, maybe I find it's not really a question. It's more of just a remark um, from experience over here in, in Europe. You know, we had um, um, this council of the, relig of the religions and the Baha'is are also on that council. And earlier this year, the Fridays from Future kids came and they were asking for support from the council of religions. And they were asking, what do you want support for? And they were saying, we're against the distribution of wealth. We're against the, what they're doing with the environment. We're against, we're against, we're against. And sometimes people have these things, we're against racism. And everyone's against something, but that's not really something that's not really the language that we find in the Baha'i writings. We don't really focus on what we're against, but we're focusing on what we're for. And we're just for unity, unity of it all, you know? And my sister, who's not a Baha'i, was, we were talking on the phone earlier today and she was talking about how she's uh, working in a university in California and she was talking about how we could, um, how she can contribute to this whole thing and whether she should protest or not and things like that. And I thought, well, the way I contribute to this whole thing is that I teach the faith because it has all the messages, not just the racism, but also the gender issue and the distribution of wealth and all and the education being for everybody and that the countries and the abolishment of nationalism, it has the full package. And so if we just can recognize that this full package could only come from God, you know, and just really try to understand what that is, you know, then, um, then I think we're stepping in, in the right direction. But if we get angry, if we, like Corey was saying about how, you know, nobody really listens to someone who's angry, you know, only angry people are moved by anger and it just is inspiring to them to get more angry. But we don't want to, I, I don't know, I think it's inspiring what he said. And I wrote that down here also, you know, you don't do anything when you yell. You know, you just put gas on the fire. 
Yeah, I, I would like everyone. Yes, I agree. I, I agree with that very much. And, and I would like everyone to, to kind of remember that we're trying to transform the world. We're not trying to blow up the world and rebuild it, right? We are trying to treat disease, not amputate, right? We're not going to amputate all the limbs and then replace them with prosthetics. We are trying to cure. We are trying to heal. We are trying to transform. Um, that's why it has to be delicate. And everyone in, in all of human history who's tried to create unity and, and world order by blowing everything up or by conquest or by war has always failed horrendously, usually right away, right? It, it's, it's clear that that doesn't work. And so what we're trying to do is, is just heal things um, and transform them. Not break, not destroy, not amputate. Please, please. Dr. B, did you want to add anything? Wow, <laughs> I'm in awe, really. Uh, this is true. We had uh, some years ago a very wonderful gentleman by the name of Stan Woodcock. He lived to be 100, over 100. In fact, he passed away 101. And uh, he gave many fireside in our house. And I was remembering him the other day, that what was the key point that he left with me, that it will be always with me, in fact, hopefully in next world and world and world. He said, Baha'u'llah has come to spiritualize mankind. We have already been religionized. We have all been citizen, etc., etc., etc. But what is needed today is a spiritualization. And that spiritualization has several elements in it. You know, that these things that Jennifer is talking and uh, Corey is talking, it's really, it's a, it's a package deal. One without the other is not going to be possible. I was thinking about the fact that Abdul Baha said consultation, you know, the consultation is very important in the Baha'i faith. And he said, before you go to local spiritual assembly that they consult, he said, you have to stand outside there to see if you love everybody there. In other words, if you value to hear from that individual anything, then you can consult and listen really. Otherwise, it would be useless really. Uh, so we are, we are, I mean, we are having a big job really at this time for mankind. It's a spiritualization. A spiritualization is really beyond the material world. We have to prepare ourselves. And if we are not prepared, uh, we won't succeed, really. And I bless uh, his soul, you know, that Stan Wood Cobb that taught me that, really. Thank you. Okay, and then one last comment, and then perhaps we close with prayers. Robin Phyllis, what seems to be happening in America because of George Floyd's death is that many people for all colors see that his death harmed us all. This is a step towards unity and diversity. Thank you for your thoughtful comment, Bob. Mm. All right. Ziba, did you want to say something? No. no. I just was put closing my <laughs> <laughs> All right. So again, on um, Corey, on behalf of everyone, thank you so much. Before I turn over to Rebecca, just for a, a very thoughtful talk and um, doing it as mild as milk with a subject that can be really weighty. Mm. So Rebecca June, uh, Keegan, thank you so much for joining us. I hope that we will see you again in the future sessions. Yes, it was very nice meeting you today. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for having us. Sorry, it got kind of dark over here. That, you know, who else is with you? Do you want to introduce? Yeah, Love this you. is my Love niece. Very much. Hi. hi, thank you for your friendliness saying hi to all of us. So much courage with all these faces. <laughs> Yeah, we were outside taking a walk this morning and we bumped into Rebecca and then so Rebecca invited us to the call. So yeah, thank you for having us. Oh, thank you. Pleasure. Pleasure. Yeah, I hope to see you again soon. Yeah, That's definitely. It. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, Rebecca.
Okay, this is um, a prayer uh, for unity by the founder of the Baha'i Faith, by Baha'u'llah. Oh my God, oh my God, unite the hearts of thy servants and reveal to them thy great purpose. May they follow thy commandments and abide in thy law. Help them, O oh God, in their endeavor and grant them strength to serve thee. O oh God, leave them not to themselves, but guide their steps by the light of thy knowledge and cheer their hearts by thy love. Verily, thou art their helper and their Lord. Baha'u'llah. Okay, beautiful. All right, friends, unmute yourself, pour yourself some tea, get some good dessert, and stay on as long as you would like. <laughs> you knew, do you know what your name means? My sister is here too, Afsane is here. Do you know what Trabarnish means? What? 